Right. Kia ora kato. Good evening. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, and welcome, of course, to this session of the Butcher Shop Public Discussion Series, which is brought to you in conjunction with Victoria University of Wellington. I'm your host, Linda Clark, and today's discussion is being recorded uh, and will be played uh, on Radio New Zealand. Uh, but this is being recorded, obviously, in front of a live audience at the Victoria University's Law School. Uh, this is the third in this series, looking at the butcher shop, primary products, uh, their place in our culture and how they define us as New Zealanders. And the product on the shelf today is dairy. Now, according to Dairy New Zealand statistics, in 2015-2016, uh, the dairy industry produced 21 billion litres of milk, or 40% uh, more than was produced a decade ago. So the good news is that dairy is producing and earning New Zealand a great deal of money, uh, 12, more than $12 billion in export revenue. So a lot of money is being earned by dairy. Uh, the bad news, of course, is the impact that farming has on the environment. The latest report from the OECD made some pretty grim reading on that front. But here is the tricky bit. Increasing calls in the cities for farmers to cull herd numbers and to change farming practices uh, to better protect the environment uh, are causing a great deal of tension. There's a real urban... Uh, rural divide on this subject and a lot of farmers see a fair bit of hypocrisy in the debate. I probably don't need to tell you but we're recording this in Wellington and in Wellington we on average buy four flat whites a week. <laughs> so while we, can, while we can rail against dairy farmers uh, on the one hand um, we might want to think closely about our own consumption of dairy on the other. It is, as I said, a subject very much uh, at a crossroads or in the crosshairs um, of a debate between urban and um, rural New Zealanders. Well, we'll talk more about that tonight, I'm sure. Let me introduce very briefly our guests. Uh, and you're going to hear from all three of our guests speaking um, for about seven or eight minutes, and then we'll have some discussion. And we're very, very keen to incorporate your views in that and to hear your views and, and have you pose some questions to the panellists. But the panellists are Roy Mears, first and foremost. Roy is a former <laughs> advertising creative director. He is the man behind the eponymous Anchor Butter ads that seem to have aired so long ago, but which none of us have forgotten. Um, well, none of us over a certain age, I guess. Um, <laughs> Jason Young is the second panellist. Jason is the acting director of the New Zealand Contemporary China Research Centre and a senior lecturer in international relations at Victoria University for a bit of international perspective. And Tim Mackle is our third panellist, our man with dairy, milk kind of flowing through his veins. Um, farm boy, now the chief executive of Dairy New Zealand. Um, as I said, each speaker will give us their thoughts um, and then we will have a little bit more of free-flowing discussion. So let's get underway. Roy, Roy Mears, you're first. Thank you. Hello. Um, as Linda said, I was the creative director and writer of the um, Anchor family that um, is actually 30 years old next year, which is frightening. Um, so I thought I'd give you a background to how we came up with the idea and... Um, what were the consequences of that idea. Um, it started uh, with a brief from the client, which in actual fact, I should say, was Fernleaf, not Anchor, <laughs> at the time that we created the campaign. And Fernleaf had given us a brief, and you could pretty well sum it up in one word, and that was modernity. They were looking to refresh uh, the ageing Fernleaf uh, packaging and uh, personality. Well, it didn't have any personality at the time. And they wanted, they wanted something that reflected the modern late 80s of New Zealand. While this was happening, I remember, uh, I think it was on the day that I got the brief, I read an article in the paper that was saying, uh, tell, uh, saying about um, 
There was a very sharp rise in divorces and separations in New Zealand. And I remember thinking, gosh, that's interesting. I, I, whether I was still mulling that over at the time I got the brief, I don't know. But they both clashed. And uh, basically what I did was I, I, I addressed this modernity in a slightly different way than perhaps the client thought I was going to. And what the client thought was I was going to have a, a modern couple in a kitchen with a BMW outside making scones. And I came back and said, well, I actually went to the agency and said, what about this idea of a family breaking up and the daughters trying to get them together again and, um, you know, sort of the fern leaf butter is almost like a product placement in a movie so that um, you got involved with what was happening. I think that sounds very modern. The agency said, oh no, steer away from that. No, 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 no. Anyway, I presented it to the client who was a wonderful, wonderful and very brave lady whose name I forgot. Um, and um, it, it was 30 years ago. And um, I, I think I wrote about four or five scripts and I presented them to her. I acted them out. Um, played the music, My Girl. There's a bit of silence at the end of the presentation, a little tear in, I, in her eye I detected. And um, then she said, well, I don't, ca I don't know whether they're going to work, but bugger it, let's do it. <laughs> and so she was, she was a fantastic, fantastic client. And so we produced the first four or five, ran them, um, initial reaction from the public was not good, in fact very bad, to the point, lots and lots of complaints, and to the point where I remember one street had petitioned um, uh, Fernleaf to stop running the ads, otherwise they'd all refuse en masse to uh, buy Fernleaf for forever and a day. Uh, but strangely enough, as the ad started to unfold and it became sort of soap-like, episodic, um, there was a huge groundswell of, of favour for them. In fact, people started really enjoying them and were looking forward to the next ad to, to appear. So uh, we got through that. I will say, though, at that point where at the start where it looked like it was going to be a complete and utter disaster, this wonderful client said, no, we're going to carry on. They'll like them. They'll get to like them. So brave. Wonderful lady. If only I remember her name. Um, okay, let's, so, so they, ran, they ran as Fernley family for about a year and a half, two years. <clears throat> and then one day we had an extraordinary meeting with uh, the parent company, Anchor, who sat down with us and said, look, this campaign's doing really, really well. We're, you know, we're so proud and excited at the success of this campaign. We never thought it would be. Either did I. And um, they said, we, we were wondering whether we could possibly have the family for Anchor instead of Fernleaf. And of course, some of the executives in the agency said, no, no, you can't do that kind of thing. No, it would be a complete and utter disaster. And I actually, at the time, I thought exactly the same way. So I asked for about a week to have a think about it. I went away. And I came to the conclusion the only way you could do this is certainly not to make a song and dance about it, as often you might be tempted to do, like, it's now anchor, and so on. Um, and what I thought at the time was, we needed a diversion. And I came up with this idea, a script, uh, where Sam, the young girl, gets knocked over by a car. It's touch and go whether she survives. She's in hospital. Mum and Dad are there in tears. And um, we put a tiny little logo right at the end that just had a little anchor on it, nothing else. Some people spotted it. And then about two or three weeks later, we had the next uh, ad that appeared where Sam was coming home, she walks into the kitchen, she notices a bottle of beer in the fridge and she said, you don't drink beer, bum. And she said, oh no, uh, well, dad came round a couple of days ago. Ah, little wry grin. She looks back in the fridge and says, so there's been some changes while I've been away. <laughs> mum, sa <laughs> mum says, what? And she pulls out at the um, anchor butter and says, anchor. <laughs> And, um, and Mum just goes, oh yeah. And then we put another little logo, and that was it. 
And from then on, it became the Anchor family. Don't ask me how it happened, but it happened. <laughs> and the public accepted it, and from then on, it became the Anchor family. Uh, that was a long time ago. I think they ran until about 1994. Um, I know during that time they were number one in all of the categories. This is Anchor. Um, they had the highest awareness of any campaign they'd done, and of course sales were really, really good. So it was a successful campaign in more ways than one because it broke a lot of rules, and um, it was also a pleasure to be part of it. So I'll leave it at that. Can I just ask you a quick follow-on before, I mean, I'm, I'm already breaking the pattern of what I said we're going to do, but you, you, you're just, I'm, A, I'm ashamed for all of us that we fell for it. Um, <laughs> so on, on behalf of all consumers, you know, we own our part in that, but it's incredible, isn't it? But the other thing is that that campaign had a complete disconnect from the product, I mean, the product from the production, didn't it? Mm. Mm. If you were doing a butter ad now or a milk ad mm. now would you still keep that complete disconnection um, it, it was a it, it, it was a sort of it was a gut idea that we should treat the product almost like as I said earlier like product placement it was part of their life but the scripts weren't centered around butter making scones and so on although we did have lots and lots of the commercials where they were doing things like that and it um it seemed to work it, i think it relaxed the public and they enjoyed the commercials more because they weren't being um, flogged butter the butter was part of their life that was their life you bought into their life, you enjoyed it, you wanted to see what was going to happen next, rather like a soap. And I think that was the secret. Would, would I do it again? Probably not. What would you do now? I wouldn't have a clue. <laughs> <laughs> All care, no responsibility. <laughs> All right, we'll come back to you, Roy. Uh, Jason Young, your views on dairy, starting now. It's an open brief. Uh, thank you. So good evening everyone. Um, I guess I'll begin by saying that I'm, I'm not an expert on the New Zealand dairy uh, sector. Um, instead, I'm, I'm more of a China watcher. So my comments tonight are, are really about trying to understand how China views the New Zealand dairy sector. Um, and that, I think that's quite important because um, New Zealand is one of the largest suppliers of dairy products to China. Uh, at its peak in 2014, 40% of our exports to China were um, milk powder. And of course, today we have a lot of Chinese companies investing in the New Zealand dairy sector, uh, so it's quite important. Um, and, and, and also it's quite important, I think, to understand why China has an interest in the dairy sector and to think about Chinese food culture. Um, so a little bit of context, of course China's changed a lot over the last few decades, growing from 200 million urban people to roughly 700 plus million urban people, um, and of course by 2030 it's predicted to have 1 billion urban people. Um, so it's, but also with that we've seen uh, China's urban areas becoming incredibly heavily populated, uh, polluted, uh, a lack of green spaces, and of course food safety has been a huge concern for the Chinese consumers. So it's no surprise to see that when Chinese people talk about food, when they talk about the dairy sector, they often think about uh, a reconnection with the natural environment and a reconnection with the local. Um, and so there's three Chinese concepts which I want to introduce uh, which encapsulate that change. The first one is this idea of uh, nong jia fan, or country style cuisine. So anyone who travels to China, who goes to the big cities, uh, maybe you'll be taken out to the countryside and you'll eat in a, a little village uh, with uh, rural food, rural people making your food, very humble, uh, um, a very humble type of experience and this really captures the idea of trying to get back to nature um, and also to fulfill China's amazing obsession with good cooking um, and the fascination with national and international uh, different types of food. The second concept is this idea of, of tertan or local speciality. 
Uh, so in China, whenever you go somewhere, if you're, if you're a, a domestic tourist, you will buy the local specialties. Um, you'll buy those local specialties and then you'll bring back an entire suitcase full of local specialties for your um, friends, relatives, worksmates, and perhaps even the security guard at the bottom of your building. Um, so there's this obsession with local, authentic uh, authenticity. This idea if you go to Shanghai you have to eat Xiaolongbao, if you go to Beijing you should eat Peking duck, and on and on and on. Now the third concept is this idea of lu se shuping, or green food. And this idea of green food, not food that's colored green, but food that is pollution free, um, sometimes organic, and primarily is grown free from the overuse of pesticides and fertilizers. So from these ideas, or this sort of cultural food shift in China, we can get some uh, understanding of how China views the New Zealand dairy sector. Um, firstly, and perhaps obviously, uh, we can talk about the white gold rush that happened post-2008. So the amazing amount of dairy product which was sold um, primarily milk solids sold to China uh, following the melamine scandal um, where many infants and children were infected and six young babies tragically died. Um, of course that led to Chinese consumers not having a trust in their own uh, industry and looking to high quality exporters of the product such as New Zealand. Um, so the value of food safety is incredibly important. Uh, but we can also extend that idea to the notion of green food um, and also to the idea of <coughs> the story behind how food is produced. So in this case, New Zealand very much holds an advantage, uh, our clean green image. Um, but the question becomes, how can we sustain this clean green image? Uh, and of course, the question then becomes, is expanding large scale output a viable long term option for New Zealand dairying? Um, and here I would suggests that I don't think it is the viable option um, to, for two reasons. The first reason is that the actual Chinese dairy industry, which was broken up uh, following the melamine crisis, is now being rejigged uh, and will be, uh, and, and even though New Zealand is a dairy superpower in the terms of the exports of dairy products or globally traded dairy products, if you look at how much New Zealand produces compared to the domestic production in other countries that's then consumed domestically, we're really quite a small player. Um, so I don't think that's, that's going to work. Um, <clears throat> the second reason is that this large scale output model would be counter to the values that Chinese consumers project upon our dairy industry. Um, in the sense that they're looking for green, and they're looking for local products, they're looking for a story. Um, and so in that sense, it's very important that in the long term, we manage any type of environmental damage um, that the dairy industry could produce because it could have a negative impact on how the dairy industry is seen. Now, I think the other thing to, to really point out is this idea of a story behind uh, the consumption of our products. And here, I think we would be wise to link it to the tourism industry, particularly the Chinese tourism industry in New Zealand, which is growing quite rapidly. So at the moment we have uh, 400,000 Chinese visitors to New Zealand annually. Um, each of them comes to New Zealand, experiences New Zealand, experiences New Zealand food culture, and then goes back to China uh, and is, is a big uh, proponent or not of the New Zealand food uh, sector. And then a part of that, I think we're really missing out on an opportunity to focus on our own local specialization, be that a national specialization or even a regional specialization as we see in the Chinese uh, domestic tourist market. <coughs> um, and I think if we look at some of the Chinese companies that are actually investing in New Zealand, uh, you can see that they are in some ways mimicking that model. So they're investing in uh, processing facilities and they're also having other types of industries attached to that. So it's really part of an experience. And if you go to China and you go and you're a tourist in the rural areas, often you will go to a farm, there'll be a hotel, there'll be Wi-Fi, there will be experiences of eating food. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an entire package. And of course that's not to say that there are not 
examples in New Zealand of uh, companies producing uh, excellent brands that can then be traded overseas. Of course, Anchor is a really, and also Fernleaf, uh, perhaps more Anchor is a, uh, a good example of that. And then there's things like Capity Ice Cream. Or for those of you who watched Country Calendar last night, there was also a really good example of organic uh, milk fruit ice cream in Faroa. So I think the, the key for how China views the New Zealand dairy industry is for us to think about how we represent the New Zealand story, how we represent our food specialities, how we promote local cuisine, uh, and how we demonstrate our green food credentials. Um, and there's a real strong potential um, for visitors to see that and to help protect the New Zealand uh, dairy industry. So I'll just uh, finish by saying uh, that in particular with the growth of the Chinese tourism and the ubiquitous nature of Chinese social media, i.e. the fact that Chinese social media is such an important part of setting the agenda for how people in China view industries, view products, view brands, view countries, um, I think that we will increasingly lose the ability to shape the view of Chinese consumers about our agricultural products. Uh, so as the Chinese say, bai wen buru jian or seeing it once is better than being told a hundred times. So it's very important that we ensure that what they see is a local sustainable industry that adheres to the New Zealand story. Hmm. Thank you, Jason. I mean, that uh, you've touched on this question of how we promote the New Zealand story. That's the um, big secret, isn't it? That's the thing mm. that none of us really... That successive governments don't and haven't wanted to address the fact that uh, it's wrapped up in the 100% pure tourism campaign that we relied on for so long. Mm -hmm. We all know it's not 100% pure. We just kind of say that behind our hand. We don't want everybody else overseas to know that it's not 100% pure if we just put it up on the posters and say it enough, it's as if it, it becomes true. In the case of dairy, it just won't become true. Hmm. Well, well, I think 100% um, pure is in, in absolute terms, of course it's not true. I mean, any country that has people can never be 100% pure. But you can have relative, relative pure, purity. So w we need to ensure that, um, that we do the utmost to ensure <coughs> that our agricultural industry is sustainable, uh, that any impact on the environment is, is, is at least understood and that there are measures in place to protect it so that it can be sustainable. Um, and to be, to be honest about that, I mean, I think, you know, there are some serious environmental issues in New Zealand, but compared to other countries, we're still in a position where we can make uh, a really good uh, sustainable, uh, sustainable agricultural sector, and that should be our goal. We'll come back to that, I'm sure, in a moment or two. Tim Mackle is the next panellist. He's, as I said at the beginning, the Chief Executive of Dairy New Zealand, so the man right in the heart of it, I guess. So over to you. Kia ora koutou. Thank you, Linda, for the introduction. They're welcome. Oh, look, over the almost 25 years now in my career in the dairy industry, and also longer if you count uh, my upbringing on a dairy farm in Kaikoura, just over, over there, um, Look, I've, I, I guess I've witnessed the changing face of dairy from a few different vantage points, and I want to share a little bit around that story today, just touch on that. Uh, what it means to New Zealand from an economic and, and uh, employment perspective, and touch on pride as well. I want to just touch as well on um, the changing face, so how are we changing at the moment? And then lastly, just connect on uh, an issue that you, this previous speakers and Linda's touched on. That's the, the issue of the connection with the New Zealand public between the industry and the role that media has got as well. So what does it mean to us in New Zealand? So um, NZIR put out a report recently and, and in that they showed that about $13.6 billion uh, was generated by dairy exports from March 2015 through to the following March. Uh, it's twice as much as the meat sector, four times as much as forestry and about nine times as much as wine. Uh, and remember that was during the low milk period, so um, we recently experienced. So if you if you look at the the peak in 13 14, that figure was about 17.6 billion dollars of export receipts, and that that actually was 35 percent of our merchandisable exports that year. So look, it is big on those numbers, um, and of course it's going to about 160 markets uh, in 2015 16 too. 
In terms of wages, about $2.4 billion of wages was paid out in that year, and of course that clearly has some big flow on effects into the economy. There are about 30,000 employees on farms across the country. There's about 13,000 in, in processing and wholesaling and so on and supply chain jobs. About 50,000 Kiwis all up uh, are in direct dairy employment. So look, that's a bit about the scope and scale of dairy uh, on the economics and employment side. In terms of pride, uh, I just want to touch on that briefly. And farmers care a lot about what the public think of them, They're just like everybody else. Um, and interestingly, a recent public perception survey that we conducted um, showed there is a strong link between dairy and and the public of New Zealand and as someone who as I said grew up in Kaikoura on a dairy farm uh, Canterbury sort of Marlborough no one really wanted us back then before the whales really came came through um, you know we were surrounded by sheep farms and I actually always admired that maybe romantic view that's probably not the right word of, of sheep that New Zealand has had you know and 70 million sheep um, you know down 30 it's still a big number and, and I sort of thought, gee, well, so I hope that hope that Kiwis can feel proud about what we've done in dairy too. But it turns out that our survey has shown us that there is a sense of connection there about the public being associated with dairy farming being one of the Kiwi identities. Not clearly the only one, but one of them. So that's good, and that's something we need to build on. So look, uh, if I can just move on to the changing face now. Look, we started about 150 odd years ago and it shifted around quite a bit. Southland used to be a big dairy hub before the sheep arrived. Um, and uh, I left uni in, in Christchurch and Canterbury in about 93. And at that time, the South Island produced about 7% of the nation's milk. It's well over 40% now. So there's been a big change during that time. Much of that growth happened in the 90s and then into the noughties. And um, of course, you know it was it was driven really uh, by uh, farmers and investors, um, both dry stock farmers as well as dairy farmers, um, wanting the best for their families, and uh, and oftentimes taking the opportunities to convert to dairy. But during that period, at the same time, um, we've had not only more farms, but we've also had productivity gains um, from science and from the likes of genetics and so on. Now, as We've heard, you know, the country has benef benefited from that, from an economic um, and arguably social perspective. You go to Ashburton or Southland or Invercargill and, and you can see the impacts there. Um, but at the same time, we know that the dairy sector has increased its environmental footprint. Uh, and that's something we had to address and we still must address. Uh, look, the, the period of growth also focused a bit too much on real estate and arguably at the expense of of profit and our competitiveness globally and of course many would argue strongly too uh, and that at the expense of the environment too in, in some quarters. So look things had to change and we have known we're part of the problem for a little while now. Uh, we've been working at being part of the solution for quite a few years now and in fact today I was really pleased to be part of a team that uh, shared the year three results of our sustainable dairy and water accord. This is a really big initiative and uh, I'm really proud of it uh, as someone who is part of the industry. It's arguably um, the biggest mobilisation uh, towards the environment that New Zealand has seen. At least one of them and arguably it is. In fact if you went around the world you would struggle to find a voluntary commitment made by any agricultural sector at the scale we've done here, 11,400 farmers. So what are we talking here? So in terms of fencing, 97% um, of dairy, and I stress dairy, waterways now are fenced off. So in 97% of the waterways, lakes, streams, whatever, that go through dairy farms, cattle can't get on them. 99%, almost 100 actually, of crossings, of 45,000 stock crossings and now got a bridge or a culvert over them. So it keeps animals out. And that was the biggest impact we could have straight off the bat because it can have a big impact environmentally. Affluent compliance, uh, it's not zero, but it's the lowest it's ever been at 5%. Um, and of course we're on the road now with riparian planting. So in those strips, fencing, putting natives in there, biodiversity, soaking up nutrients as well. So, look, there are some really good results there, but we know that the big challenge for us is nutrients. Um, there's no getting away from that as well, and we have to manage that nutrient footprint. So that's part of the accord too. We've got about 83%, I think, of farmers doing nutrient plans now, and we wanted 85, so we're not quite there, but we'll keep working hard on that one. So, look, dairy is investing. Those activities I talked about estimated about 
a billion dollars, a little bit over, from farmers themselves. Um, and of course, they're investing in the likes of Dairy So we, we've got a water quality scientists and economists who are part of the, the process of trying to be part of the solution uh, across the country for how we develop policy and address these issues collectively. We're also investing in uh, science and farm systems to try and develop new ways of farming to manage the footprint down and at the same time maintain or enhance profit too because that's really key. I've had a few farmers say to me that adage, you know, you've got to be in the black to be green, and it's true. We have to be competitive to be able to keep investing in these initiatives too. Uh, so look, um, the other big challenge I can't get away from in terms of changing face is to run as hard and fast as we can to convert as much of that volume into value, as Jason's really alluded to as well. And so that's going on right now too. And, and it's happening actually at scale. A lot of people argue it's not happening fast enough, and, and fair enough, but I'm actually quite optimistic about the progress and about the future in this respect. I think Fonterra alone in the first half of this financial year um, has converted additional volume, not what they're doing already, into value-add products like consumer and food service and so on, equivalent of about 227 million uh, liquid milk equivalents. So if you think about I think it's like 227 bottles of one litre bottles of milk, extra into value-add products. It's two tarred two dairy companies just in the like, first six months of the year, if you like, if that means anything to you as well. So look, they're heading towards down that track. We want to go faster because we know that um, it's not all about volume at all. It's about adding more value from here. So look, the, um, the last point I wanted to touch on, if I can, is that challenge and opportunity of getting New Zealand behind dairy. Uh, so what do we know? Well, from our public perception results, we've just uh, got back. We do this quarterly. Uh, Dairy farmers are feeling pretty beaten up, you know, and you'd expect that from the negative press that's been out in recent times. Um, and they are feeling upset because, you know, to be fair, they are regularly singled out as the cause of all the water quality issues in New Zealand. And as I've said, we know we're definitely a big part of it, but we're not the only part. And and the other issue is, um, of course, you know, they are, they are putting their best foot forward. Not everyone, but the majority of them are trying to. But look, uh, you know, we are sensitised to negative media, as you expect, and we thought that would translate into negative public sentiment. But we were, we were pleasantly surprised, um, because over the last year, public perception has actually increased. Now, marginally, but we'll take that. Um, and on top of that, when you ask the New Zealand public, do, do they think dairy farmers are valuable members of the community, then the majority either strongly agree or agree. It's just unsurprisingly to you when you ask the public, do they do a good job with the environment, the numbers drop down quite a bit. And if you live in Christchurch, then they drop down even further. Uh, and, and animal welfare, similar kind of pattern, although it's not a bigger hot button. So look, why is it important? I mean, because we need the whole country behind us to transform our industry uh, from volume to value, um, to be the top of the pile cons competitively, but also in the way we produce our, our food. And more importantly, um, to play our part in overcoming environmental challenges here at home. But also, maybe some of that technology can help other pastoral-based countries around the world too. So look, the issues are real, like water quality, and we do own these issues. Um, we can't shy away from them. Uh, we know that the most important thing to earning the, the, the support of New Zealand is actually to demonstrate results on the ground, and that's why the, the Sustainable Dairy Water Accord is so important. It's about doing the right thing. So if I can leave you with a few takeaways. Uh, dairy helps underpin the economy. Um, of our country and it does create job in every corner of New Zealand but that doesn't give us the right to do whatever we want. Clearly like other sectors such as sheep and beef uh, or even uh, urban centres, dairy has an impact on the land and waterways and there is still a lot of work to be done in this space um, but we are working actively to improve that situation. It will take years to fix it um, and look we have been at this for years so far through the Water Accord and other initiatives. Um, and last point would be that you know, negative media does not necessarily equate to rally. And in fact, I think there's a lot that New Zealanders can be proud of about the dairy sector in this country. Thank you. Can I just ask you a question directly off the back of that? I mean, I think you, you're presenting that material. Obviously, you've done focus groups or polling of um, New Zealanders' attitudes to dairy. Um, and it sounded to me like you're looking at that in a binary in a binary way, like, you know, the question is, 
do you think dairying is an important part of New Zealand's economy? Um, well, if you tick that, well, that means that you know that's a tick for you guys. Yes, it is. But in fact, the whole this whole issue is much more complicated and nuanced than that. You can actually think that dairy is important for New Zealand, but also think that a lot of dairy farmers are out on a limb, getting the water for free, making a lot of money over a long period of time, chasing the dollar, and not looking after the environment. Yeah, those two um, streams of thought are not actually um, completely in conflict. Yeah, look, you, you're absolutely right. And and so what I couldn't present to you, obviously, with the time available, was the fact that we are drilling down deeper than that, trying to find out what are the most important issues, not just, you know, is it important to the economy. Well, you know water is and one water, of the most important and, issues, and, right? And water is the And you the don't most need to do focus issue. groups to know that. Um, oh, look, I, I think what you do need to do is, well, as I said, quite quite openly, we, we care about what the public think. Firstly, actually, because farmers want to live in their community. I've had people really upset because they want to, to actually play their role in their community and they think they're doing the right thing so it's important from that perspective but secondly we know we need the support behind us and we need to tackle these issues and resolve them so we are drilling in and I think you do need to keep a read of where the sentiment is and water has come out right at the top of the pile as you well, say. Well it's come out at the top of the pile because there's a whole lot of rivers that people can't swim in anymore and there's certainly a whole lot of rivers that people can't drink out of or bathe in or you wouldn't want to have your children swimming in them that's for sure you can't fish in them um, so it's not a kind of it's more than just a focus group kind of uh, issue of feedback isn't it this is real well it's just to be technical there's 1500 respondents on the phone plus focus groups so it's not just about talking to people it's about being uh, but look you're, you're right it you're is you're really real. sounding real. like a politician it is real <laughs> <laughs> so look um, absolutely I agree with you I think it's a little bit more than that Linda I think that that Kiwis actually have D hold water up there at the top of their Maslow's hierarchy, right up in the top three maybe. Maybe, you know, keeping a roof over your head and food and then there's water and that's cool, that's great. Um, so it is very important, but plus the experiences people are having. And I don't for a minute suggest that dairy is not part of that, uh, or irrigation or anything, but what I would say is that let's try and have a really broad discussion about what are the key contributors. For example, the Selwyn. I mean, you know, too easily as it singled out its irrigation. Well, actually, if you talk to the scientists and talk to Lincoln University and people down there, they will tell you that actually, you know, it's a southerly fed rain type of thing too. And if you don't get the right weather patterns, that thing goes up and down and the water goes up and down. So we just, and why it's important too is because New Zealanders need to be approaching things the right way to fix the problems. If we go down rabbit holes and, and we actually shut things down or spend money on the wrong things, we won't get the outcome we want. So so I do agree with you. Yeah, although making this making this more complicated than it needs to be is another way of delay, delay, delay. I mean, I am unfortunately 10 years older than you and um, <laughs> ever since I came out of university, you must be I have that. been hearing that uh, we've got to turn volume into value. I, I began journalism in the late 80s and every minister of the primary industry since then has said exactly the same thing. It's got to be changed, volume to value, volume to value. In fact, the incentives to change from volume to value have never existed in the dairy industry because A, of the way that the industry is structured um, and the, the collective way that Fonterra is structured means that actually you're just trying to get that volume out the gate and get your money out of it. Um, and it doesn't incentivise any change in the way that the industry is structured and run. And isn't that one of the fundamental problems that's got you locked into the same, doing the same old thing, tinkering around the side, sure, but you're fundamentally doing the same old thing as you've always been doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, look, it's a bunch of things and you've touched on some of them for sure. Um, uh, where we are right now, though, I, I think you, you're going to see a slowdown in growth for sure uh, because of a, a few things. Well, we just went through a tough patch economically and uh, conversions just dried up, but also the land and water planning processes that are happening around the country. And we've already got, uh, if you like, moratoriums in certain regions to convert. So the Waikato, which is where I live most of the time, um, you know, you can't intensify right now with the plan that's been notified. So there are things in place um, to to actually, and, and we can see that now. And in fact, cow numbers have gone down anyway, as it turns out, because of the tough times in the last couple of years. But look, long term, we've got to create a vision for what we want in New Zealand. And that's we something always, that but we've had the vision, right? We know that we've got to create greater value with the yep. product we've got yep. and that our niche in the world is exactly as Jason talked about. It's the high quality Agree. green food. That's our niche in the world, right? So we don't need to debate this anymore. We know exactly yep. where it is that we should be going. We just seem to have trouble getting there. 
Well, yeah, but look, it's not, it hasn't been easy, but I have to say that as a, the numbers are big now. Fonterra gets a lot of bad rap for being a commodity player, but if you actually unpick and work out, they just added two more Tatera dairy companies in that consumer and food service in the first six months of the year. They're looking to try and do four just in this year alone. That's big shift at scale. Now, I know a lot of the dairy companies around the world, and frankly, you'd be hard pressed to find a more innovative dairy company than them. I mean, you know, when I lived in the States, you don't, they're not at that level of sophistication. So it's not easy, but f criticism, fair cop, fair cop. But I'm optimistic. I think we're on a good track now and we've got to keep it up. And it will be underpinned by the brand values that you're talking about and that Jason talked about. I think that's key to it. Wouldn't it make a difference if you had to pay for water? Well, I mean... I mean, you know. Aucklanders do. Yep. If I take a shower in Auckland, turn on the, and I turn on my water, I'm paying for it immediately. So if if I'm a latte drinker from Auckland and I've got to pay for my water, why shouldn't the farmer in the Waikato have to pay for his? Yeah. Oh, look, I, it, it's. It's an issue that will, I'm sure, be addressed and it's going to be spoken about more. Farmers are already paying for water in some quarters. So if you're in an irrigation scheme and if you go into Central Plains, the one that's coming through, you've got to pay quite a bit to do that. Now, that's, that's it about... It would change behaviour, though, wouldn't it? Well, I think if there was a water change. In what sense behaviour, though? Because really we're talking about nutrient and challenge. Uh, water use efficiency is important, but it's not the big game in town. The biggest game in town for us to make a big difference, tangible difference, is to manage our environmental footprint down particularly through nutrient and it's got to be collective like it's got to be with the other sectors and many of the large catchments which I could name other sect livestock sectors contribute as much nutrient as dairy does and that's a little known fact but the scientists know it so we can't achieve our goals as a nation unless everyone's pulling in the same direction. Let me get some questions from our audience so the gentleman in the red jersey had his arm up first um, if you just wait for a moment we'll get a microphone to you. Okay. Okay, just to add to the questions on the environment, the greenhouse gas effects of the ruminants, um, to what extent are you relying on still getting a free pass from the government as to the contribution to greenhouse gases from the dairy industry, which you've had up till now? That's a fair question because we're talking about water for obvious reasons, but greenhouse gases is, is uh, maybe equally to New Zealanders, but globally it's a massive issue as you know. Now look we we are we acknowledge that we are 40 as agriculture 49 percent of our total emissions that's what you're alluding to and within that dairy is roughly half a little bit less than half. We've been investing in science for a good 10 years to come up with um, mitigants against methane which is our largest greenhouse gas as you know from animals um, and look it's getting close there are some technologies that are really really promising which we're hoping that will be rolled out maybe in the next maybe the next five years or so, that sort of time frame commercially. Um, we have to invest ourselves because no, not many other countries do pasture and they've got different systems which lend themselves to different technologies so we've got to do our own work. So look, there's a lot of work going on there and we're, we're about to embark upon an education program with farmers and consultants, people to help them just to try and get them in that frame too, that yes water is key but so too are other areas. So look, we'll do what we can. The one thing I would say though, and this is not a reason why we should get off scot-free at all uh, because we we won't, uh, is that pasture-based livestock systems are generally at the top of the pile in terms of their efficiency of protein produced per kilogram of carbon dioxide. And if you take a life cycle assessment uh, approach to this right across the value chain. So, um, and, and of course, you know, I don't want to sound defensive, but let's just look at it critically. You guys are all clever people. Why are we 49%? There's a bunch of reasons. We're pretty low in population in New Zealand. We're not industrialised, so we don't have in industrial stuff. We feed 40 million calorifically a whole lot more in their diets around the world. Um, and uh, we've got high renewable energy. So there's actually a bunch of reasons why agriculture now, as other countries start to reduce their industrial and their transport things, then their agricultural emissions will start to increase as a percentage too. So, so globally, we need some solutions to sort this, and that's our key focus. All right, there was a question just behind you, and then I'll come over here. Was the... Yeah, so the, if you pass the microphone to that woman behind you. 
Uh, thanks to the panellists. Uh, just touching on that idea of the public perception survey that uh, Dairy New Zealand's been doing and looking at the PR campaign by Fonterra and the industry that started this year where Richard McCall seems to be telling me that farmers do what they do for my benefit. Um, and just the quotes in the media that Jacqueline Trow, who I think was uh, oh. Fonterra's chief operating officer, said that campaign, or former officer, that campaign was in response to... Um, uh, and I quote dietary fads and also um, <coughs> special interest groups. And I just want to know, because I'm not from a special interest group, how genuine is Dairy New Zealand and Fonterra and the industry in pushing a campaign to try and attract those people that are responding well in your surveys or really genuinely working with special interest groups or the growing New Zealanders that have concerns around the industry itself? Yep, good question. Look, uh, um how genuine. Look, I'm not going to sugarcoat it and pretend that it wasn't easy in the early years and we're still on a journey in terms of taking everyone with you. And like any population, farmers, um, you know, there's different viewpoints out there. But look, there has been, I said to you, I grew up on a farm and I've been there for a little while. There's been a sea change of attitude towards it. They don't necessarily always do the right thing, but generally we are going in the right direction. Um, and, and I'm sure, I can't speak for Fonterra, but I'm sure like us, they understand that we need the New Zealand public um, to at least be able to sit down with us and work out how we can solve issues. And if we can't get to that space, then we've all got a problem in that respect. So that's that's the motive behind it. Um, I just wanted to start with Roy Mears and that wonderful set of investments, which did certainly captured my heart and mind and the hearts and minds of everybody I know at the time. And we thought about dairy affectionately because those ads captured the modernity that we did recognise. So I wanted to ask all the panellists to say, now, if you were trying to pick up Jason's term, provide the story to the Chinese consumer, for example, or to win the hearts and minds of the people that you're clearly not winning, Tim, who would those people be? Roy, do you want to go first? No. <laughs> <laughs> Bad luck. <laughs> Let me think. <laughs> Jason? Uh, well, well, I think <coughs> New Zealand is, uh, as a population is quite different to, to the 90s even, so I think you would have to tap into a, a different demographic, a different set of audiences. But, but I think the key, again, just as what, what Roy did so masterfully in the, in the 80s and 90s, is you have to be able to tell a story, i.e. provide a story. It's not just simply, this is great, buy it, but actually give some, something more. And that's what in particular Chinese consumers are looking for when they buy our products. They, they want to know the backstory. They want to know where it was produced, how it was produced. <laughs> if the cows have names, which I don't think <laughs> many farmers <laughs> name their cows. They certainly didn't did. in Blenheim when I grew up I there. Did. Oh, um, so, th so there has to be a story um, about who, who produced it, how it was produced, uh, what's the quality of the product, um, who, what are the local communities. Um, that, are, that are doing well out of this, or and what are the challenges that people have? Mm. I, I think, w without being too specific, um, you you also need to approach it in as a refreshingly different way as possible, um, as perhaps we did back then. Um, th 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 there's a lot of cliches in 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 advertising, and um, it just doesn't wash anymore and I think you really have to work hard to look for an angle or to think of an original approach uh, idea um, and then and then go with it and ideally uh, an idea that um, makes people think twice and go oh hang on are you sure we can do that? And, and I think if, if I were doing it again I'd be looking for that that opportunity um, to present uh, New Zealand um, in a um, in a way that hasn't been done, and we, we've we've had lots of, of 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 good stabs at it, but I think it's probably time to um, because there are issues and we have to address those issues. Um, but there's always that interesting approach that um, is just sitting around the corner. Does it involve an all-black captain? No. <laughs> I just knew no, you no, were going to say that's, that. Sorry, that's a cliche. Yeah, but, <laughs> but, 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 and yes it is, but it seems to have 
worked, doesn't it? Probably. Is it? You tell me, you guys. Um, uh, well, I'm not Fonterra, as you know. No. I mean, I would put uh, farmers up, uh, f f you know, from our perspective, because they are the genuine people that are are out there doing the business. It's not people like me, it's people who are out there doing it. So, um, And you're seeing more of that So, in those campaigns you're talking about. And of course, the ones to our customers overseas. Mm. I saw a really cool clip recently from the US uh, Secretary for Agriculture, and some of you might have seen it. And he made the point really uh, eloquently, actually, that farmers are farmers, so we don't have to be farmers. Sounds a bit backwards, but the point he's making is that they farm and we don't have to, you know, if you go back generations and centuries and whatever, a lot of people were involved in agriculture having to grow food. But these days, uh, only a small percentage. And while people might lament that too, to a degree, at the same time, it does mean people can do what we all do uh, and go to the supermarket and get our food. So, so look, you know, they, they are in some ways heroes. Why can't they be? Because they're out there producing food in sometimes tough environments. So I put them up. Uh, thanks, Jason, for being on the side of the Chinese market. And you sort of identified those three sort of values of ideas, the, the country style, the, the local specialties, and then, and then the green food. If you were to fit that on ahead, and then we're thinking about New Zealand in a similar light, are there any opportunities within New Zealand for us to sort of hit those similar notes when we're talking about our product development? Or are we just simply too small a country to have that sort of that regional, that local flavour into, into the products that we're trying to develop? particularly within dairy, um, or do you think it just doesn't work within, New, uh, within the New Zealand context? Um, I think it does work in the New Zealand context, okay. um, in Capiti ice cream. Uh, for example, it's, it's a regional brand um, and it could sell incredibly well overseas. But it's really sort of touching on that experience of food as well. So not just, here's a product, this is where you buy it and this is where it comes from, but sort of tapping into the tourist market. So when tourists come to New Zealand, they, mm. they go somewhere, they eat some food, they get introduced to it, they know where it comes from, they can see how it's produced. Uh, and even through agritourism, they can meet the farmers. Yeah. Um, they can meet the local communities, uh, sort of welcoming people into our country and showing them a broad spread, the whole the whole New Zealand thing. And that, mm. that can be a little bit challenging uh, when people come from countries where English is not the first language. Um, and so New Zealanders, are, having grown up in New Zealand, I would say New Zealanders are incredibly welcoming to people from overseas. But there is that extra challenge uh, when people come from a country which English is not the first language. And so I think we could maybe step up a little bit and, and be a bit more welcoming and be a bit more local. Uh, for our visitors here, and give them the complete package. Thank you. Mm. Question in the middle. <coughs> uh, hello, question for Tim. Uh, so, modern humans know a lot about animal sentience. Um, we know that cows have complex cognitive abilities. Uh, they feel a wide range of emotions similar to humans. They have relationships with other members of their species. They feel pain and pleasure. So my question, given all those facts, the question is how do we justify an industry which routinely takes children from their mothers, uh, kills the mother, kills two million bobby cows a year, uh, keeps cows in a perpetual state of lactation and pregnancy, impregnates, m impregnates females without their permission, without consent, and kills cows when they're no longer of value, economic value. How do we justify that to animals which uh, have complex cognitive abilities and emotions and in many ways are very similar to humans. That's my question. Okay, look, so as an industry, animal welfare is key to us. There's animal welfare and then there's personal beliefs and I think, you know, you, you, you're touching on both there and uh, you know you you may have different beliefs to, to what I do about food production and where you get it from animal welfare when it comes to that it has to be right up there at the top uh, along with water and so you know, there are practices that that we have done in the past um, and those sort of things have been phased out, like tail docking, for example, just simple things that just shouldn't happen. Uh, things I listed were all current and verifiable. Sorry, what was that? Um, well, I'm not so. I'm actually an animal scientist by training myself, and I'm not quite so 
sure I agree with the bits at the start about how cows feel and so on, but anyway, that's fine. That's yep. Right. Look again. You know, like that's that's not my area of expertise. To be honest, I, I was into physiology and food science. So, so look, uh, I, I, that's that's fine. If that's your belief, just let me finish, if you don't mind. Um, but when it comes to animal welfare, which is the bit that I can talk to you about, uh, it's got to be right up there at the top. And uh, so, Bobby Carves, you touched on that. That's an area. It's a challenge for us. And. Um, you know, we we are starting to think really hard about how we do this differently. Uh, not not just about managing them, but actually about the issue itself. So look, we haven't got all the answers, and I'm not suggesting we do. When it comes to should you eat dairy or not, that's your own personal view. But 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 other bodies around the world, if you take um, World Health Organization, there, there are there are recent reports to say that actually to solve a lot of our hunger and, and dietary constraints around the world, that. Yeah, no, the, your question's been well made. I didn't know anything about New Zealand uh, milk or dairy product. Just doesn't seem to be one of the things that stands out. And I came to understand, oh, this dairy thing, it's a big issue in New Zealand, really, after I arrived here. So my question really is how New Zealand is really competing on international level in China, because whenever I go with China, I go and buy milk from the supermarket. Seems that European countries are doing better, especially Netherlands. You see a lot of Dutch um, products there, and they do have very fancy cows pr printed <laughs> 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 on the milk cartons. I uh, guess my question is that, um, what do you think of uh, how New Zealand is really promoting its own products? I mean, um, you touched on those issues before, but I'm just wondering, want you to bring out the perspectives of the European countries and Australia and Americans, how they produce, uh, how they promote their products in Thanks. China. Okay. Um, just quickly, I think our cows are pretty fancy, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but, but I would say that, that New, Zealand, New Zealand is one of, if not the largest uh, um, uh, sources of dairy product in China, but a lot of that goes into areas which you don't see the brand, mm. um, so there's a lot of um, food processing services, there's a lot of uh, chef schools that use um, uh, bulk butter, and et cetera, et cetera, I mean, and there's, you know, Frontier is always talking about um, the amount of pizzas in China that have cheese on them. Um, which come from New Zealand. So you don't actually see the brand when you see that. Um, so we're very much a bulk supplier uh, and some of our brands are, are quite limited. If you go to any international hotel in China, you should be able to get Anchor Butter uh, for breakfast. But other than that, if you go to the supermarket and you see a lot of, of the even baby milk powder products, you won't actually see a New Zealand brand. Um, and so I think, uh, as Tim was saying, it's part of that shift from being a bulk supplier to being uh, some uh, uh, companies and brands that are acknowledged in China. For making more discreet products? M more discreet and valuated products. Yeah. Okay, question here. I'll come to you in a mm. moment. Um, I've got, you've mentioned um, the green food in China and mm. you've talked a little bit about carbon before. Do you see a request for information on the actual carbon footprint of the products? You've mentioned life cycle assessment, and while yes, the dairy industry might have a big impact, relatively speaking, in New Zealand, per product or per liter of milk, it probably is very comparable to the carbon footprint of dairy products internationally. So, Peter. do you see questions coming that way from the market asking for that sort of information? Um, in my own experience, I haven't seen that, but I, I would say that the, the, the key difference. From the people I've talked to, the academics and, and, and business people, is is the way that the product is actually produced. So a lot of the f uh, dairy farming in China is is barn farming, mm. um, more of the North American model, whereas the New Zealand model is pastoral farming. Um, and so it it appears, and I think it probably is m more quote unquote natural. And I would believe that the carbon footprint would be lower because a lot of the feed into the industri to the barn farming in China is actually corn produced and some of that corn is actually imported from the states. So, but, but I haven't seen the signals come through. Right, we're nearly out of time, so I'll just get a couple of quick questions. So, yep. Why doesn't Anchor and Fonterra invest more in plant-based milk such as almond, soy, oat? 
Many large companies overseas are already making the shift, and I can give you examples of companies. Um, Nuva in Israel, Elmhurst in the States, Dean Foods, which goes as Dairy Pure, um, Denon in Europe, which is France. Okay. Yeah. I think uh, you touched on a, there's, there's substitutes or alternatives for dairy, absolutely, and there's also synthetic foods that are coming along as well. Um, personally, my personal view, I think that's a positive development for the globe. If we're going to 9 billion people in 2050 or even 10, then we've got problems. And organic production, for example, is not going to foot the bill for all of those people. So we have to find other ways to feed people. And so I think synthetic foods actually uh, is a positive step potentially for humanity. I'm, I'm not against it. What I do think, though, is for dairy in New Zealand, we've got an opportunity in a small way, particularly if we position ourselves up here and the way we farm to the highest standards and the way we do things to position us right at the top of the pile in terms of the real thing if you like if you want to call it that it may not be real to you um, so there's that the other thing is nutritionally it's still pretty darn good and I can spend hours with you talking about nutritional benefits and that is my area of science of dairy compared to other substitutes which are not as complete and you could talk to the World Health Organization they'll tell you so I think there's a place for both I'm really saying. And I think you'll find some of those food companies you're talking about that have enough scale. Can I just clarify what we'll you mean by synthetic? Because I'm not really confident I understand what synthetic is. When I say synthetic, I'm talking about making a burger patty out of, uh, not out of meat, but out of uh, plant-based or something like that, or even, even the fermenting milk, for example. Um, I think, you know, as I say, fundamentally it's a good thing for the globe if we can explore other ways to feed people because that's what we're going to do. All right, really almost out of time, but you have had your hand up for a, quite a long time, so this is our last question. I'm very conscious of the things that the dairy industry has agreed to do to shift things, but if we're to think about it differently, don't we really have to start committing ourselves to outcomes rather than just to a series of discrete Actions. steps mm -hmm. which we can perhaps agree to? Isn't that going to be not enough. It's a really good uh, challenge, Alistair, and I think um, that was really the point I was trying to make about vision. You know, like you know, I do think we have to plan a vision for Aotearoa and what we want out of this in terms of all the different types of land uses and um, and how best to optimise it. I'm not sure where that happens, and I know you've been involved in an initiative to try and do some of that too. So, look, I'd, I, I agree with you. Um, taking actions and taking steps is a pretty important part of the way, but uh, of the journey. But as you say, uh, we do need to know where we're going, otherwise any road will take you there, right? So that is pretty important. I don't think that's quite what he was asking. I mean, isn't the isn't? I mean, I'm, I'm, well, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but your time's out and your mic's off. But um, <laughs> <laughs> but essentially, what isn't the, wasn't the question not that. Um, let's have another plan, but let's have an idea, like, let's set some targets for what the plans will have and let's have a time frame so that we know that we're actually going to get there. Cause it, plan yeah, because at the moment, isn't that one of the disconnects between, as I said at the outset, the sort of urban-rural divide, but it's not that clear, it's not that binary. Okay. Um, isn't part of the problem that even though we acknowledge that a lot of um, dairy farmers individually and collectively are taking this issue more seriously, mm. this issue being the environment and their environmental impact of their business more seriously, we still aren't seeing a very clear pathway that says in X we're going to have Y. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, well look, a couple of things. As I said, uh, there's a plan around actions, but the plan around outcomes Partly it's the government. They've just put out Swimble River Target. Whether you agree with them or not, they have put a stake in the ground around that stuff. Well, they but did put a stake in the ground part, part previously, and now they've taken that stake out and they've moved it backwards. Part, partly, um, as it turns out, we're in the just in the process of updating or refreshing our own strategy as an industry for dairy farming. So they're good comments, and I'm going to take that into that, uh, because, you know, we are kicking around how bold do we need to be to be, to do the right thing in this respect. So, look, it's, it's but an I mean, you can kick around a plan forever, can't you? I mean, you and I could, you know, be on this panel in another 10 years, and, and you'll still be talking about volume to value and 85 plans on what you do about urine going into the land. I mean, it, this is... Surely the time has passed now. The science is in. We know the damage has been done. We've got extremely pessimistic forecasts on the swimmability of our rivers going forward. We can't really afford to be 
strategizing ourselves into a point of inertia, can we? Uh, look, do we need action? Absolutely. Is all the science? And absolutely not. In fact, if you had an EWA scientist sitting here, water quality scientist like John Quinn instead of me, he would tell you about the complexities of, 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 of water quality at full stop and what we don't know yet. Now, we need to keep investing in that as a country because we need to really understand what are the levers we've got to pull on to get the outcomes that we need in that respect. But no, we don't have all the science just yet, and that may sound like rhetoric, but it's absolutely true. Uh, and we've got enough to know now what we should be doing at the moment, exactly. but over time, uh, you know, more will come through and we will change our, our plans and But it's not an either or, is it? I mean, you could have the kind of outcome that that question is talking about. Uh, you could put your stake in the ground with a deadline so that we all knew we were going. And if the science improves along the way, goodness, you might be able to improve the deadline. But at the moment, we don't have either of those things. No incentives. Why Please thank a very patient um, and... and and um, fantastic guests, actually. Very nice, very brave of you, some of you, more than others, to <laughs> agree to be here. Um, and if you'd like to join me and, and thank Roy Mears, Jason Young, and Tim Mackle for joining us this afternoon. <laughs>